Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we're fortunate to have Jake Lindsay. Jake goes by Coos OCD on Instagram and has killed some unbelievable coos deer bucks. And uh, he's uh, born and raised in southern Arizona. He's married with five children. He's a full-time firefighter paramedic with Tucson Fire Department. Uh, has been hunting big game in Arizona for 22 years and guiding for 13. Uh, he just got off an October coos deer hunt in southern Arizona uh, where he shot a really nice buck and helped a hunting partner of his uh, shoot a nice buck. Uh, Jake, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Jay. How are you? Good. It sounds like uh, you and your hunting partners had a pretty good October coos deer season. Oh, we have, Jay. One one that we won't ever forget that's for sure tell me a little bit about it um uh particularly y- you you were the one to strike last i believe you got uh, a buck just a few days ago um and then you helped your friend is it mark hardy that's correct mark hardy yeah i i killed we helped mark uh shoot his buck opening day of the october hunt and then a few days later uh, Mark came out and returned the favor and helped me shoot my deer. That's awesome. Now, to give the listeners a little bit, for those that um, don't know you, um, shooting big coos deer is not foreign to you. It's something you have a passion for, and you've had some success in years past uh, uh, chasing some big coos deer and, and getting to harvest a few big coos deer. What is your biggest personal coos deer? My biggest buck I killed in 2009 and he scores officially 127 inches 127 inches is that the buck that's a four four on one side three on the other correct yeah yeah beautiful beautiful buck and so so 127 is your personal best and uh this buck of marks that you just uh helped with uh what what kind of size is he uh, well, you'd have to see him in person to appreciate it, but uh, he's a a three by four, uh, although his fourth scorable point is only an inch long, but he's a mainframe typical three by four, uh, but his three by three frame is 132 inches. Yeah, that's an unbelievable uh, buck. I saw a picture of it, and I mean, as far as a, a typical three by three, I mean, I let's, I call him a typical three by three with just a tiny G four. Um, it's as big a frame three by three as you can get. Would you agree? Absolutely. I've never personally uh, even held one uh, this big and so symmetrical with such little deductions. Absolutely. Just a beautiful frame deer. Um, I, I want to ask you some questions about your big buck um, that you shot in 09, and I want to ask you some questions about, uh, if you will, Hardy's buck. Um, it, I take it that Hardy's buck is not a buck that just showed up. That's probably a buck that you guys have, have known about and been watching. And part of what I try and do on this podcast is um, – I, I, I try and get into the minds of guys that are chasing big deer and, you know, what's going through your mind as far as strategy, you know, some of the heartache that you face, uh, you know, knowing about a buck like that or like the one you shot in 09 and, you know, all the things that go with it. And, and as well as that, I always like to try and uh, let the listeners as well as myself kind of gain some takeaways from guys that have had the opportunity to, you know, watch and, and witness uh, big bucks and then and then see it through fruition and, and you know, see them get harvested. Um, when, when did you first know about Hardy's buck or when did he know about it? Mark glassed that deer up four years ago. And wow. uh, uh, he, of course, was quite a bit smaller four years ago. But uh, the first time Mark really got to know the deer was the next year, uh, which was three years ago, and he started getting some pictures and, and whatnot of the buck three years ago. 
Okay, so three years ago. So he saw it four years ago, but I'm assuming because of age class and probably antler structure, it was a nice buck, but not one that maybe just, you, you know, you went crazy over. But then three years ago, you start, you know, he starts getting trail camera photos and, 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 you, and you see it. What kind of buck was it three years ago? Because I'm always interested to see a buck like this, you know, do they blow up? You know, did, did he get bigger, then smaller, then bigger again? You know, kind of how did his antler transformation uh, work over the last, uh, say, from four years, then three years? What what has what the buck done? Well, Mark would probably be uh, the expert on this one, but as far as I can recall, uh, three years ago, four, I'm sorry, four years ago, he was your typical uh, 90 uh, low 90s buck and then uh, the following year which would have been three years later uh, he was right about 100 inches and uh, he was pretty recognizable uh, although some of the points may have come off the main beam in different locations but he was still pretty recognizable I think his biggest jump came from uh, 2000 and 14 to 2015, which would have basically been two years ago, two antler sizes ago. So he jumped from probably, I'm guessing like a hundred, then he jumped all the way up well over 110 and all of a sudden became a buck that was like, oh my gosh, we've got to focus in on this buck. That's correct. And did, did you guys, did you specifically mark and you guys, did you specifically hunt this buck last year and didn't get it done? I mean, is there any backstory that like, oh yeah, we shot and missed him. You can't believe it. We didn't get him, or or no, we just we never found him during the hunt. Is there any story with that? Yeah, there there is. Jay, we 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 really hunted uh, hard for the first time for this buck last year, and Mark spent quite a few days leading up to the hunt scouting trying to put glass on this deer which was extremely difficult where this deer was living and uh we just and i would go and help him as well and we just never could put glass on this deer obviously we knew he was there with trail camera pictures and stuff but we never put glass on him uh at all and then on the third day of mark's hunt last year we were fortunate enough to find another really big deer that Mark ended up taking as well. Okay. So it, it's interesting that, you know, you, you know, the deer is there. You guys are, you know, as good as they get as far as glassing and, and you still can't put, put eyes on the deer. You see another deer. That's a great deer that you can't pass up. And, and, and Mark takes that deer that to me, that kind of in a bottle, like right there, you know, like, I don't know what the word is. It like bottles up why I love coos deer hunting. Um, and, and, and I'm just curious your thoughts on it where, you know, this deer's there and you still can't put eyes on them. And I think that's what keeps us all coming back because think about some of the deer that you don't even know are there. And you're out looking and then all of a sudden, boom, you see a big buck and then you never see him again, that type of thing. I mean, you never know. I mean, I guess my point is you could sit on a hill for 14 days in a row and never see the buck and he's right there alive and, and well the whole time. You just haven't put your eyes on him. Absolutely. No, you're 100% correct. These big bucks are obviously big for a reason and they find their little tiny home range and even... Uh, like in our case, we had a pretty good idea of this buck's home range, but we just still couldn't put eyes on him. And obviously, when you're hunting in country that holds a buck like that, there's always the potential that there's another one not far from there. And that's how we got fortunate enough to find his other buck that that he ended up shooting, which I, I, I do want to add that that other buck that he ended up shooting uh, had a gross score officially over 120 inches as well, and also officially netted over 119. So just a tremendous oh my deer, goodness. tremendous uh, typical four by four buck that obviously we couldn't pass up at the time. So that just tells me that 
you know, the, a couple of these deer found a place where they could live and grow up and not get killed, not get, you know, hunter pressure. And, and, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's unique. Um, but it's, it's, it's interesting to think about that there could be a couple of bucks of this caliber, uh, you know, within it, within a close proximity of each other. Um, but I think it goes to show for cooster hunters out there listening that there are places um, that if you push yourself far enough to to go into the some of those places where maybe your density of deer is not very high, maybe your uh, chances of seeing a deer is not very good. Um, maybe some of those places are areas where you know you can find if you're going to see a buck, it's probably going to be a good one because because you need age class. Um, you know, and it's interesting that you guys found a little pocket where a couple of these bucks, um, came out. So your last year, you guys are looking for the buck that he killed this year, but this big giant four by four typical steps out and no way he can pass that up. That's correct. And then this year, so this year, the, the target focus obviously was on, uh, this buck, correct for that's, Mark? That's, yeah. that's the buck you wanted. That's right. So were you able to see him from at all uh, before, I mean, during the summer, were you able to put your eyes on him or, or did the buck just never show up until he got killed? No, Jay, we, we were not able to put glass on this deer uh, wow. until, until the day before the, se- the hunt started. So huge anticipation because I assume you have trail camera pictures so you know he's still alive. You know a lion or, or an archery hunter hasn't killed him. And y- you go into a situation where you've never seen the deer. Tell me about how you were feeling the day before the season uh, or, or you know, if you saw him the day before the season, before that, your anticipation going in there, was it like he's a ghost? Let's just go try and find him. Absolutely. I think that's what keeps us going is, you know, the heart, we've always felt that the hard part was over as soon as we find a big buck. And it's just a matter of uh, trying to live with that deer as often as we can. Both Mark and myself, we got young families and we're we're pretty busy people and Mark runs his own uh, business as well. So we, we just, we, we use our time as wisely as possible, but we uh, when we find a deer like that, that's where all of our time is dedicated to. And uh, we we certainly made no exception for, for this buck. And even with all the time that we spent prior to the hunt beginning, uh, especially Mark, Mark spent an, an ex- exponential amount of time trying to put glass on this deer finally, uh, we still just c- couldn't manage to do it until... Uh, the morning before opening day of his of, of both of our hunts so it's not it's not a matter of you weren't trying to put glass on him it's a matter of you you couldn't put glass on him or not until the first time you saw him it wasn't like well we glassed for him a time or two and didn't see him it was we tried different angles and and looking and looking and looking and just couldn't couldn't put eyes on him that's that's right. You know, it's it's kind of funny. I'll I'll drop a name here, but Dwayne Adams had a funny term in your one of your last podcasts, the angle of the dangle, and it it really does speak uh, volumes with with how important it is to just get different angles. I I strongly believe that these big coos box live in a, a an extremely small core area and. Uh, although you may get them uh, on trail camera in one place and you, you have it, we all have a tendency to focus on the one place that maybe our camera is because that's where we're getting the pictures of them. That still might not be exactly where that buck lives. And, and uh, so it's always important that you, you almost 360 try to try to look in every nook and cranny that you can. That makes sense. Um, let's take a quick break here. I'm super happy to announce that the Go Hunt Insider has just launched the newest insider state, Oregon. 
Every state is different when it comes to units, draw process, and regulations, and Oregon is one of the most complex states to figure out. Like other states, you'll have the Go Hunt Insider filtering 2.0 to decide where to apply and hunt with filters for trophy potential, harvest success, weapon type, season dates, and a lot more. Oregon has 10 big game species and covers a total of 67 units. You will not only get an analysis of units, subunits, and seasons, but also species breakdown with the interactive graphs, plus a state profile that outlines how to apply and fees associated with applying in Oregon. Go to gohunt.com forward slash jscott to sign up and receive a $50 Kuyu gift card just for signing up. I have known the owners of the Outdoorsmen in Phoenix for over 20 years. They are the authority on optics and hunting gear. Outdoorsmen is the leading designer and manufacturer of high-quality tripods, mounting accessories, and pack systems for all hunters. Their customer service is the best in the business. Go to Outdoorsmen's.com or call 1-800-291-8065 and use the J. Scott promo code to receive 10% off any products. Okay, Jake, um, back to what you were just saying. I think I've got a couple questions there. If, if you don't mind, um, how regular of a trail cam pick from not this season, but last season? So, so you were hunting for them last season. From that period of time, let's say about a year's time, fast forward to, you know, when the hunt started, are we talking like, four or five trail camera pictures of this buck over, over that year, or are you talking like 30 or 40 or hundreds? What, what kind of, what kind of like hit rate were you having? Well, it, it varies depending on the time of the year, of course. Uh, but you know, this buck was no different than any other, as far as, uh, venturing to the, the trail camera, uh, more often, at certain times of the year, you know, in that uh, late July, August, and, and early September time frame when they're doing the majority of their growth, that's uh, certainly when we got more pictures of his buck. And uh, b- but we 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 had a, we always had an idea that we were close to his home range because we continued to get pictures of him even throughout the year, uh, easily. 40 to 50 pictures of the buck. Okay. So let's back up a second. So for those out there listening, um, an experienced cooster hunter like yourself with coos OCD, like your, uh, like your handle on Instagram, are you telling guys out there listening that, you know, if they're going to be targeting coos bucks, the best time is in the velvet. And, and would that be what you would consider the, the, the time to get the most pictures of a buck? Yeah, I, I would say that's when you're going to get absolutely the most pictures of a buck. That's when they're most likely moving the least amount. They're traveling. Their core area is, is certainly smaller and uh in their home summer range uh, and and so there's not there's not much reason for them to move especially in most of these summer, southern arizona mountains where water and and food is pretty plentiful do you notice uh, i'm curious I, I i've gotten other people's take on this do you notice like um once they go hard antlered um do all of a sudden the pictures of them on those same cameras, do they just stop? I mean, is it a, I've heard people say that, you know, very, very consistent in the velvet, very consistent, very consistent. And then all of a sudden just boom, pictures stop. What, what's your take on that? Uh, sure. I think anybody who runs cameras has, has seen that. Uh, I, I will tell you though, Jay, I don't, uh, I also believe that it has to do with how close your camera is to his core area. Uh, and um, I've heard different takes on why they they uh, might hit mineral and salt licks more often during that prime growth time. 
uh, and and uh, uh, some of them make sense, some of them don't. But uh, I I think that that for, for obvious reasons, uh, when they get closer towards the end of their growth, and and certainly rubbing the velvet, for some reason they have no need for. Uh, that that mineral lick as often as possible anyway you know I, I i've i've always thought that it made sense and somebody told me once that the high nitrogen levels from the monsoon seasons and all the food in in all, in all the feed that we've got out there that that salt helps balance it out i'm not a biologist um, and i could be 100 percent wrong on that but it just kind of made sense that that uh it it's more for a, a balanced nutrition during that time of year than it than it is anything else. Yeah, it makes sense to me. Um, I want to ask you a question about core area in this in this particular case of Mark's buck. Now that the buck has been harvested, in your mind, how big of an area? When you're saying this buck had a core area, if you had to guess. Uh, what would be the, let's call it from edge to edge, you know, if we're talking about a circle from the left side to the right side, so to speak, um, or, or what have you, what, how tight of a range do you think this particular buck held? Uh, one side of the circle to the other, I'd give him 800 to a thousand yards. So... So 800 to 1,000 yards from one side to the other. That, I mean, that right there, if you think about that, that is a super tight range. And so my point with that is if you're a glasser trying to find a buck, when, when they stay in that tight of a circle, no wonder you guys couldn't put glass on them. You know, and I don't even know the country, but if it was thick, if you add any, you know, thick brush at all to a to a to a range that's that narrow, that tight, I can understand why it would be extremely difficult to see a deer like that. Absolutely. You know, it was thick, Jay. Uh, you know, I think the majority of these really big deer live in uh, a country like that. And it makes them far more vulnerable when they're out there on those open slopes and stuff. And, uh, you know, I honestly think, though, that, that the the biggest obstacle is getting over the mental challenge of staring at the same stuff day after day after day and uh, getting over that, um, that hump of, of knowing, uh, of then finally seeing him. You know, mentally, it, it, it can kind of wear you out. and You would start thinking that maybe you're wrong and you got to go look somewhere else when really your gut's telling you he's still there. He's just not moving. Well, I, I think I can't, you know, well, I can't imagine because I've been there, but it, you know, it never ceases to amaze me how mentally t tough it is. I think one of the positives is if you're able to have a trail cam and, and you've got recent photos and you know that he's there, I think the thing is, I think some people get pictures of coos bucks and, and they just don't honestly believe that their core range is as tight as it is. And, you know, I, I know guys that are big buck hunters and, and I, you know, I, I've ran, I've talked to him and said, Hey, you know, your big bucks, you know, way over there. What are you doing over here? Oh, I just, maybe he's moved. And I think I, I talked to guys like yourself over and over and over. And that's why I love having you guys on. I think it goes back to show exactly what you said. I mean, if you know, I think you said earlier, if you find a big buck, that's the most important thing is finding them. And then kind of honing in on his core area. Is that, is that what you're saying? Is if you can see a buck one time, you have a much better chance of finding that buck again because because their core areas are so tight, the odds are he's in his core area. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah I would, Jay. Um, I, I think that something that's really important to, to recognize, I guess in anything that you want to be successful in, is that 
if you don't envision yourself being successful, then you won't be. Or if you can't dream and you can't imagine wrapping your tag around a buck like that, then the only way you're going to is by pure luck. And of all the, uh, this is going to sound like a personal development book, but it's so true that in all the most successful people out there, they truly do envision themselves going through the motions and, and seeing it all work out. And I think a lot of people, whether they get a big buck on camera or they happen to jump one up while they're quail hunting uh, in the spring sometime, uh, they kind of go back to camp and, and they like telling the story of the big buck that they saw and or the the big buck that they shot at last year and uh, it's more of a campfire story and a legend and it is a an opportunity to capitalize on the next year and actually see that it can be a reality it's a lot of work and it's a lot of effort but it can absolutely be a reality speaking to that exact uh, example that you bring up if if someone were to see a big buck and let's just take a buck like some of the ones you've shot or the hardy buck, you know, that's just a giant buck. You know, I consider pretty much anything over 120 a giant. And with that being said, I think you bring up a good point that some people see these deer every once in a while, but they may never actually go back and ever look for the deer. And what that's you're right. saying is if you see a big buck, Put in the time, and more than likely, if you see him, go back and keep looking and keep looking. He's going to be right there somewhere. No, absolutely. And if you're not going to go back and look, then call me up. I'll, I'll go. <laughs> I don't know, man. You might be chasing some phantoms because uh, I've heard some <laughs> wild stories over the years. That's um, true. So... Mark's Bucks, 130-inch, rough mainframe, 3x3, three three, uh, giant buck. He saw him the, the day before the season. Um, did you Were you guys able to, like, stay on him till dark or anything like that, or was it just a quick glance? And, and, and then how did your, your strategy then focus in on opening day and kind of how, how did it all go down? Yeah, well, we found him. Uh, a little bit late in the morning, uh, the Thursday m morning before the hunt started, we found him a little bit late in the morning. We only got to watch him for about 30, 45 minutes. And then he sort of went up and over into a little, a little side Canyon, a little cut. And, uh, we then got right back on the same point for the afternoon and we were not able to locate him. Uh, the evening before the hunt started. And then first thing the next morning we were on the same point and still were not able to locate him the next morning either. Do you feel like he was out of sight from you the whole time where he topped? I mean, was there no place to reek, you know, to set up, to, to look into that side Canyon or, or was it, you know, was your angle bad? What was the deal? Well, it, it absolutely had to do with the angle, uh, from where we were, where we had initially glassed him up. Uh, we, we stayed there the even the, the rest of the day before the hunt started and even started there the next morning, opening morning, still didn't see him. And that's when we decided we needed to, to split up and, uh, Mark needed to somehow get get over and look up into that canyon that we had seen him go into the evening before. I'm sorry, the morning before. Sure, I understand. So here's a question, if you can follow me here. So you, Mark, you guys saw him go up and over into a side canyon. Do you feel like where he went into, not where you saw him, but where he went into, do you feel like that canyon was more of his home or do you believe that where you actually saw him was more of his home what do you feel like was a place where that deer lived more well that's that's hard to say jay i i uh i guess i try not to uh i try not to say uh 
that I know exactly where a deer lives or I know exactly what a deer is going to do. Um, but I, I can tell you this much, um, w- where we glassed him up initially was in a pretty safe, uh, shady, thick part of that uh, mountainside. And where he went, in, went up into was was relatively the same. He, for some reason, just chose to go over there up in that canyon. And uh, that easily could have been his his home range, but we're talking 150 yards uh, right. distance from where we initially glassed him up until where we glassed him up the next day. Okay, fair enough. Um, when you did first see him, was he all by himself or did he have a couple little uh, buddies with him that were, that were his eyes and ears? Yeah. Well, I, I think that maybe that's what ended up being the demise of, of this buck. Uh, he, he's kind of a loner, even in the, the three or four years that, that Mark spent a lot of time with this deer and that I had the opportunity to do the same as he kind of did his own thing. And then once in a while he'd have a buck that would, would want to hang out with him uh but in in this case uh, when we first glassed him up the day before the 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 hunt started i glassed up a little spike and i i thought i had seen a a bigger body deer go in the trees uh so i kind of kept going back and forth to that spike and uh sure enough then this deer popped his head out and so um, you know, I, I, he, he kind of had some buddies, but, uh, I, I wouldn't say that he had one real close. He was still kind of a loner. I think a couple bucks just like tended to hang out with him more than he hung out with them. What is your setup, um, tripod and binoculars? What is your go-to setup? I use a slick, uh, carbon fiber, uh, 634, um, tripod real lightweight carbon fiber fiber uh breaks down real small and i've got the outdoorsman's pan head and i've got the swarovski 15 by 56 hds that i that i use okay i love those new hds don't you oh they're great fantastic glass yeah for sure okay so Let's let's let me ask you a couple of questions about Mark. Mark moves so he can look up into that country where you saw him go into. How did it go down from there? That's right. About ten o'clock in the morning, he moved over there uh, to to go look up in there. Uh, he was fortunate to have his brother-in-law Jason with him as well to kind of help pick it apart. Also, so I stayed on the one side and they went over to the other side and we spent the rest of the day uh just trying to pick apart both sides and uh it wasn't an extremely far look for for mark and jason uh, how far but, roughly um, anywhere from five to seven hundred yards okay so they were pretty tight if they were able to see him they they were almost within range to shoot him that's that's exactly right and and you know my look was a little bit further but we were definitely uh, within range for sure and uh, so we looked all day long and of course nothing happened on my side and then right about 5 uh, p.m about 10 after 5 is when uh, they notified me that they had found him right up in that cut where he went into the day before Wow. That's uh, the excitement level for you hearing that had to be just incredible. Um, I'm going to guess that he went over the top and do you know, like how far did he go from where he topped over it? Was it like he went on a big walkabout or was he just tucked away in a nice little shady spot up there? Jay, I think he just tucked himself away. The fact that we didn't glass him up, Friday morning at first light, uh, I think there's a strong possibility that he just stayed right over in that side canyon the the entire, the rest of Thursday and even all day Friday. Okay. And so the, the, I'm always curious where big bucks 
are, are found and where they actually die. And I think it goes back. I did some podcasts like you alluded to with um, uh, Dwayne um, Adams. What if you had to say which facing slope was it? Was it a northeast face? Was it a north face? Was it a what, what direction? So, so in other words, I'm trying to grasp where was that buck harvested as far as where did he spend his time? What direction was that slope? It was generally a north facing slope. Okay, so in other words, here's a big buck, here's guys that hunt big bucks, and you guys kill them on a generally north-facing slope, which I'm assuming in most places north-facing slopes are the thicker, more dense, more shady side of the hill. That's right, Jay. Okay. In your experience with other big bucks in on October hunts, would you say that that is a very common denominator? Yeah, I would. I I would. And, you know, um, there's always the exception to the rule. I shot a buck two years ago, Jay, that that, uh, scored a little over 120 inches. And he, believe it or not, lived on a south and west facing slopes. So, uh, you know, you you can never uh, predict, but there is a general rule. So I, I think largely that has to do with hunting pressure as well. So in other words, if they're not getting huge pressure from other hunters, they could very easily be anywhere. You're saying what I'm reading into it is that if they're getting quite a bit of pressure, they tend to be in the thicker areas because if flat out, if they go in the open areas, they're going to get shot. Absolutely. I think it, also has to do with just being vulnerable in general, whether it's the mountain lions, just being seen in general. So uh, that's why I think the majority will will usually be found on a north, uh, north, northeast, or even like Dwayne said, you know, some of these northwest facing slopes get a tremendous amount of shade as well. So anywhere there's some shady cuts, uh, that's generally where they're going to be found. Okay, let's take a quick break here, Jake. Real Game Calls featuring the Elk Reel. Real Game Calls makes innovative, realistic, and easy-to-master calls using their proprietary, revolutionary design. They are located and manufactured in Gypsum, Colorado. Their calls were designed and battle-tested on some of the hardest-hunted terrain on Earth. Check out ElkReel.com. Use the promo code JSCOTT and receive a 20% discount on all purchases. Go to www.ElkReel.com. PhoneScope is a company that makes custom-molded, precisely engineered smartphone digiscoping adapters. Photographing wildlife has never been easier. It is simple to text photos and videos from your smartphone and share them with your friends. PhoneScope stands behind their product with a 100% money-back guarantee. Get yours now by using the JSCOT16 promo code and receive 10% discount on all purchases. Check them out at Phonescope, that's P-H-O-N-E-S-K-O-P-E dot com, or on Instagram, at Phonescope. Okay, Jake, you brought up another good point, and that's lions. Um, Do you feel like a a coos buck can live, um, well, let me me think, how do I want to ask this? Do you think lions are harder on coos? coos bucks in thicker country or harder on uh, coos bucks in more open country? Which one do you think the lion has the best opportunity to kill a buck, if you had to guess? Well, it would make sense to me that they have a better opportunity in thicker country just because they can move in closer. Um, and, and, And going back to what we were saying earlier, just as far as where, where a deer might spend the majority of their time in the thicker part of the mountains and in the cuts and stuff like that. That's probably uh, where it's going to happen the most. Now uh, that might sound contradictory to 
uh, being vulnerable on those open slopes, whether it's to hunters or mountain lions. I just think that in general, um, the heat, the predators, the, the mountain lions, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the hunters and everything like that uh, will will keep those deer moving less and uh, certainly in, in places where uh, they feel a lot more comfortable, which is going to be in the cooler temperature and where there's a lot of feed and a lot of cover. Yeah, I agree. I, you know, part of always hunting, you're always, you know, it, it's easy to look on the yellow slopes because deer stand out and you can see them. Um, and, you know, it, like you said before, I mean, a, a, a coos deer buck can be really anywhere. Well, I do, it is fascinating that, you know, it seems to me that these bigger coos bucks in general, when I talk to guys like yourself, seems like more often than not, they get harvested on the thicker slopes. And what's interesting is, you know, it's the, the biggest hunter out there, the mountain lion, um, you know, thinking back to a lot of them that I've seen, I've seen mountain lions on open slopes. I've seen them on thick slopes. I've seen, I, I, I can't, you know, tell you that there's a direct correlation to where I've seen them. And I've seen a bunch of them as I'm sure you have. Um, but but as a coos deer hunter with the you know the October hunts already already over these November hunts and then I believe there's like a late November early December hunts in some of these southern Arizona units. Um, would you tell guys out there uh, to 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 be more successful? Would you be focusing more on thicker north facing slopes than the areas that are open yellow grass or you know op- open faces? Uh, yeah, I would, I would say so. You know, every, I think each hunt is different, Jay, uh, from the October hunt all the way through the December hunt. I think the, the, the closer you are to October, the, the less deer movement you're going to see. And I think the closer you are to December, the more deer movement you're going to see. So if, if you're targeting a specific buck, getting around his home range his core area it probably makes more sense to uh, put in for the october tag now that might upset a few people that really like to draw those october tags and the odds might not be great anymore but (laughs) that's just well that's just that's just how it goes if you want to pattern a big deer yeah i mean i think i think for years i mean if you even go back to you know dan king and and um uh you know, Jim Reynolds and, and, and go back to, you know, Dwayne Adams and, you know, some of those guys that have been doing it a long time. You know, it, it's, it's not a secret that, you know, a lot of those bucks have been harvested on the October hunt, but for a lot of my listeners out there listening, you also need to remember that October hunts, typically the temperatures are not, you know, high eighties to even mid nineties. And your deer movement is, I would say, half as less as it is a couple weeks later on the November hunt, just from a temperature range in itself. So I think a lot of people listening to this podcast need to understand a guy like Jake and and his buddies that are out there, they're focusing on one or two big deer. And these guys are willing to sit on a hillside for seven days in a row and not see a deer but know that the big deer might show up in that period of time. Most people listening to this podcast, they don't want to go one day without uh, seeing a deer. And I know how it is with guys like yourself that have routinely killed and helped kill big giant deer. You have to be willing to suck it up and literally suck it up like it's sucks. I mean, it, it, you know, it not seeing a deer for three days in a row There are not many people that can go and not see deer. So, I mean, I don't think it's any big secret. I certainly think October, if you have the ability to pattern buck and you have the time to focus in and and hunt one specific buck, yeah, you get first crack at them. The odds are you probably have a better chance. But I'm going to say for the majority of, of coos deer hunters, they might be better off with those November, late November, early December and um, hunts because you, like you said, you've got 
half as much more movement because of temperature. And, yeah. and I would ask you a question. Do you truly feel that temperature is the reason that they move more a couple weeks later? I do. That's that's my opinion, though, Jay, but I really do. Okay. Okay. I that's, will tell you this much, though, Jay, also just in regards to uh, the, the time of year that you're hunting. I, I, I think that whether you have a, a big buck spotted or not, it's it's far more important that – uh, of the country and, and the place that you're hunting. So if, if you do not have a big buck, um, if you do have a big buck spotted, it's probably easier to shoot him in October. But if you're in the right country, there's a, still a strong possibility that you're going to kill that deer in, in, in early November or even late November. And I largely believe that's because uh, of, hunting pressure in general don't expect to find uh, a, a really big deer during that uh, early november or late november hunt unless you're hunting in country that just does not get the pressure let's talk about that a little bit there's places in all over arizona well, we're talking specifically southern Arizona, down by Tucson, down where you live. There are places in units that there are, there is road access, and it it seems to me that the bigger bucks tend to be further from the road, and that further from those areas where people can get to in a, in a day hunt, meaning. Um, you know, can they walk there? It's opening day of the, of, of the deer season and they put their pack on and they've got their lunch and whatever, and they go and they go hunt and they can walk, you know, person can only walk so far and then have to return and be back, uh, to camp that night. So do you think there's a direct correlation between consistently finding big bucks and getting in that area where you can't walk in one day and return back to camp, you know, let's say 30 minutes, an hour after dark, walk back in your camp with a flashlight. Do you think there's a direct correlation of size of bucks if you can hunt in those areas where the day hunters don't get to? Abs- yeah, absolutely, Jay. Uh, at least at least for multiple days anyway, you might be able to hike in there uh, once but you try to spread that out over multiple days hiking in and out and it's just it's just too tough guys make sure to check out part two with jake Lindsay on episode 205 guys thanks for listening and supporting my podcast if you would please go on itunes and leave me a comment and leave me a five-star rating that helps our placement on itunes If you'd like to send me an email, you can at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com. You can also follow along our adventures at jscottoutdoors.com, also on Instagram or Facebook. I'd like to thank my sponsors for supporting this podcast, GoHunt.com Insider, PhoneScope, The Outdoorsman's, and Real Game Calls.